Yes, I love to talk about Jesus. I love to boast in the Lord. Did you know that that's scriptural? Psalm 34 verse 2 says this, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear and be glad. You know what? I just really believe when we magnify God, when we boast in the Lord, that those who are discouraged and humble and downtrodden, they're lifted up, they're encouraged. And I love that ministry. I love being a part of that. So let's welcome the Holy Spirit right now because He is such a lifter and He is so good at helping unfold the wisdom of God's Word into our life. And we need His help, don't we? Precious Holy Spirit, we just invite you right now into our lives to help us. Give us revelation of the Word of God right now. Help us to see and perceive. Help us to hear and understand like Jesus said in His precious name. Amen. Yes, heaven is real. Part four. Let me start with a little story here. A young man was captured behind enemy lines during a war and he had been sentenced to death by a firing squad. But the night before the execution was to take place, he was offered another option. Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., you will face the firing squad or you can walk out of that door over there. The man asked the captain, he said, what's beyond that door? The captain replied, no one knows, only unknown horrors. The man thought about his decision all night long. And the next morning, he made his choice. Guess what it was? He chose the firing squad. After the shots rang out, the captain's secretary asked him, what was beyond that door? The captain responded, freedom. But very few people select the freedom because it's unknown. You know, in part one, I quoted the popular thought that most people would prefer a known hell to an unknown heaven. As we continue to explore the reality of, yes, heaven is real, allow me to tap, just for a moment, your deductive reasoning. God made you a person of intellect, like your Creator. And in Genesis 2, God formed man from the dust of the ground. So think about this for a second. God has already built some intrinsic value, even into the dust, the substance of earth, with His launch of humanity in the body that He formed. Then in verse 8, of Genesis 2, God, it says, planted a garden in Eden, meaning land of delight. That's what Eden means, land of delight and happiness, placing his human in the garden full of everything pleasant to the eye. It was paradise. Now consider a few things having said that. When mankind sinned, we didn't fall from heaven. No, no, no. We fell from paradise on earth, the garden of Eden a perfection that God planted and prepared just for us that was beyond beautiful, full of fascinating plants, trees, populated with all kinds of amazing animals and wonders that have in great part disintegrated, really, over these past thousands of years. Like the second law of thermodynamics says, everything moves toward entropy, disorder, decay, rust, corruption, chaos. I mean, try leaving a room in your house alone for 10 years and don't touch it. It's going to be a mess after 10 years. Romans 7 simply calls it the law of sin and death. So now, this is essential to our understanding of God's character. When God saved you and I from our sin, He did not replace us. He redeemed us. He restored us. But He kept our original design of person intact. He did not replace you. But he redeemed you. And it's critical to see this. This is God's way of doing things. Remember what Malachi 3 verse 6 says? He said, I the Lord, I do not change. God doesn't change. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's right. So God who created everything, seen and unseen, never changes. His mercy endures forever. If He is the Redeemer and not the Replacer, never ever buy into the lie that His unfailing love for you could somehow give up on you and decide to just, well, let's just replace Him. Let's just replace her. You are irreplaceable. And consider this. Is it a coincidence that the first two chapters of the Bible have us placed by God in a paradise, a heaven on earth? Then 
the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, have God restoring us to a new earth, not a replacement earth, but a reborn earth that is connected perfectly to a new heaven by the new Jerusalem that descends from heaven to earth. No, this is no coincidence. It's God's redeeming, excellent plan for you and me. Now, you may ask, well, then why is a yes, heaven is real so important to my consciousness? James 1.17 says this, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. Again, this is God's unchanging character, right? And His methodology. Without a vertical perspective, heavenly downloads can't get to you. Heaven is creation central. Even your identity is written down in heaven. The blueprints and the chromosome engineering plans for all of life matter. Every organism are stored in the banks of heaven with angelic scribes and elders as the librarians. This is a heavenly power come down plan, people. Jesus already defeated the devil and his army with a cross and a few Roman nails. So never, ever confuse God's amazing grace to save one more lost soul as somehow a power failure for his vindication. That is a big lie. How can anyone ever buy into the, the sovereign God and intelligent designer of everything good and perfect being some tired, fragile, ancient being that's fading in relevance because of the big bad attacks of the forces of evil? That's a fool's theology and it's an arrogant deception. Look, God has already defeated darkness for eternity. Ephesians 4, 8 says, Jesus led captivity captive. Did you know that 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 mocks death saying, Hey, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Oh, heaven is such a guarantee because of what Jesus did on the cross for us that the only way to miss out on having your name written down in heaven, the only way is to reject Jesus. God guarantees heavenly citizenship for all who believe on Jesus. It's the ultimate of inclusion meets the ultimate of exclusion. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now look, God's love for us all, that is the ultimate inclusion. But one way for all, Jesus, just one way through Jesus, that is the ultimate exclusivity. You see, this convergence of extremes showcases the power and authenticity of God's amazing grace. You see, it makes heavenly citizenship, child of God identity, the authentic passport for life. You know, there's a TV commercial, I don't know if you've seen it, but it parrots this cultural, cultural lie through a young man who's obviously very troubled and confused. And he says this, he says, it's okay to be lost. Now, just imagine this for a second. Imagine, let's say, a six-year-old little girl roaming through a wilderness full of grizzly bears and hungry wolves and saying to her, Honey, it's okay to be lost. You know, you just go have a good time. Of course, it's never okay to be lost. It's perfectly advisable to admit you're lost. Guys, sometimes us guys, we don't admit we're lost. Admit you're lost and ask the Savior for help. But embracing your lostness like it's an identity is a deception the devil hopes will steer you away from accepting Jesus and therefore accepting his heaven. Only you have the right to accept Jesus' sacrifice for you. God will never force heavenly citizenship on you. Never. You can reject Jesus. C.S. Lewis once said this, so fascinating. He said, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, the soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. God is always merciful and ready to save, but we have to accept him. We must choose him. The end of this life tends to bring a clarity on your true citizenship, your true identity. And guess what? Political or social correctness has no power to shade it one way or the other. Billy Graham's ministry shared a story when I was just a boy about a young woman raised in a very wealthy family. 
they were well-known in elite social circles and they had relationships with all the influencers. One night she was out partying and on her way home, she was in a devastating car accident with her brand new sports car. They rushed her to emergency, but the doctors had to tell her parents that there was, there was nothing more that they could do for her. She just had minutes left. As her mom kissed her forehead in those final moments, the girl's eyes fluttered open. She whispered, she said, Mom, Mom, you taught me how to party. You taught me how to hold my drink just right. You taught me how to flirt with boys. But Mom, you never taught me how to die. You know, lateral thinking, void of the vertical heavenly promise that we have in Christ, is always hopeless. Now, I want you to hear another true story. And this time, I'm going to ask my wife, Pam, to share something very intimate from her heart and her life. In 2014, my mom began having this knowing that her time on earth was done. She was very healthy. She was in full-time ministry. But on Valentine's Day, she made a card and gave it to my dad. And she was saying how she loved her life with him on earth, but that she was going to meet him again in heaven. And dad showed it to me. And of course, I didn't like it. I didn't understand what she was saying. But my mom had a knowing and she was seeing something beyond this life. That summer, she started having many seizures, and by that September, she was admitted to the hospital where her condition was a mystery. Doctors were coming from all over the country, not knowing why she was losing her ability to talk and communicate, although she would break into a hymn or a song, and she could even pray for people. And the doctors and nurses, they would marvel as they would come into a room, the presence of God was so strong. And many that weren't even believers, they would come into the room and they would touch her hand and they would turn to me and say with tears in their eyes, what is this power that I'm feeling? One doctor told me that his whole life was changed because of her and he decided he was gonna go into the mission field to help the poor and needy in certain countries just because of her life. And many people would visit her and say that she ministered to them because the presence of God was so strong in the room that actually people were healed. And this continued right up into the beginning of 2015 when my mom went to be with Jesus. And on that day, God's peace and glory flooded the room. It wasn't empty, it was full. And there were tears, but there was tears of victory. And my mom, she marched into the reality of heaven, welcomed by family members and angels, and of course, the King of Kings. And my mom knew how to take off mortality and put on immortality with God's help. There was such an evidence of power as she embraced eternity. Yes, heaven is real. Oh, yes, Pam, I agree with that. Yes, heaven is real. That's precious. Addressing the reality of heavenly life. Now, I need to expose a lie to you. I need to expose this lie. I'll call it ghost theology. We need to expose it right now. Some people, yes, even Christians, have bought into this unbiblical idea that in heaven we are all ghosts blowing around like a little vapor or Casper the ghost. It's part of the reason why lost ideology has become so popular. Nobody wants to be a ghost. Most would rather be lost human beings than blobs of spiritual vapor and goo. As I said this just before Pam shared her true story, horizontal living, void of the vertical knowledge of what Jesus, he said, is preparing for us, that's fragile, weak, ghostly living. Think of it. God took six days to create everything that we're living in right now. Jesus has now gone to prepare a place with Father God's help now for 2,000 years for this glorious, redeemed, heavenly future for us. Praise God. Can you even begin to imagine the extravagance? Mm. Why do you suppose we're so politically divided and angry? Why are we so sexually confused and ready to be pacified by the latest trend in dysphoria? 
How has the religion of tolerance suddenly made everyone so intolerant? Even woke people can't stand each other. Why is that? Look, it's no mystery at all. We cannot live, love, or succeed with just a lateral view, a worldly perspective. We must have a yes, heaven is real understanding based on truth, biblical truth, a vertical dimension that is guiding light to our thinking, our confidence of heart, directing every one of our choices. You see, ghost theology regarding eternity is a deception meant to discredit God's great plans for your life. Consider this, Christ in his resurrected body had to actually calm his disciples down, calm their fears down by saying this in Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Jesus is like, look at my hands, guys. Look at my feet. See, they were scarred. It's really me. He said, touch me and see for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. Oh, did you get that? He even asked for something to eat after that to further prove he was physical. So they gave him a piece of fish and he ate it. Think about it. Jesus ate fish in his resurrected body. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 says this, There's coming a time when the dead in Christ shall be raised imperishable and completely transformed. Not ghosts, but glorified. Transformed. Physical and glorified. Jesus said, he said this, Ghosts don't have flesh and blood like you see I have. Give me some fish. Let's eat. So now what does, what does physical and glorified mean? Jesus walks through walls in his glorified body. He eats fish. He wears clothes. He appears, then he disappears. He has complete mastery over space, matter, time, and all energy. Are you beginning to get a little picture of the actual reality of heavenly living, living in a glorified state? The physical, the material, space and matter are not intrinsically evil. Yes, evil can affect the physical, but Jesus, God's son, came to redeem us along with all of his creation from that evil. Look at Colossians 1, verse 20. And through the intervention of the son to reconcile all things to himself, making peace with believers, that's us, through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Things. Did you get that? Not just reconciling and making peace with us, but things. Why? Because it was always God's plan for everything, seen and unseen, to benefit you. 1 John 3 verse 2 says that we will all be like him, Jesus. Not ghosts, but in a physical body. A resurrected, better than new, amazing physical body. Yes, you are going to be good looking. Not a replacement you, but a regenerated you. Jesus came to redeem us as the last Adam. God's not throwing away his plan. He's investing everything to redeem his plan, to restore it, ransom it. Why? For a reborn you. Let's remind ourselves again of our passport status. Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21. But we are different because of our citizenship in heaven. And from there, we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by exerting that power which enables him to even subject everything to himself, will not only transform, but completely refashion our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrected body. Oh, the truth is that it's this life that is the vapor. Yes, that's right. You've been taught to believe that this life is the real thing of substance and weight. And actually, it's so intangible compared to heaven's reality that God calls this life that he created and said was good, but he calls it a vapor. Look at James 4 verse 14. What is the nature of your life? You are really but a wisp of vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears into thin air. Oh, he's talking about this life in in comparison to immortality. Oh, my dear friend, when Jesus said, quote, I go to prepare a place for you, did you really think that it was going to be a step down from even the best of earth? Absolutely not. The Lord is preparing something far more 
tangible, beautiful, substantive than anything mankind has ever known or imagined on earth. It blows this world away in color, sound, beauty, taste, worth, power, along with all the critical and visible virtues like love, joy, and peace. Oh yeah. Hebrews 9 verse 23, listen to this. Therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be cleansed. I got to read it again to you. Therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be cleansed. Did you just see that? Copies of the heavenly things. Earthly copies of the heavenly things. My friend, heaven is real. And it's more real than this earth you're standing on. Earth has beauty that is instilled into it by God the Creator, but it is still just a copy compared to the original. God made all of this and called it good. Yes, He did. But a day is coming when He is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So don't get so attached to less. Live to be honorable to God, to steward the less so that you can command the more. We're all on assignment, so don't be slack with anything. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But you accomplish that by standing on earth. This is a race of faith, my friend, a, a contest of trust. And to obey is better than sacrifice. So live to glorify God. You do that with the vertical God perspective and heaven in your peripheral. You see, heavenly ID is the real passport to life and living. Jesus, our Savior, redeemed us. Do you know what that means? Basically, He bought us out of slavery, out of the devil's kingdom of darkness, and translates us into His kingdom of light as children of God. Now, that's a real passport, a passport that angels and devils tremble over. But that's not all, my friend. At that moment, your true identity is documented in heaven. I mean, it's written down. Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus said this to the people following him. He said, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Philippians 4, verse 3, Paul wrote this about his partners in ministry. He said, my other fellow laborers whose names are what? In the book of life. They're documented. Revelation 21, verse 27, God's talking about who has access to heaven's new Jerusalem. He said, and nothing that defiles or profanes but only those will be admitted whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. Not lost people, but found people. Oh, well, Pastor Stephen, that sounds, that sounds kind of exclusive. You're right. No one will force you to go to God's heaven. Nobody's going to be forced to accept God's love. If you don't want your name, your true identity written in the book of life, you have full authority to deny yourself God's free gift of life. Forgiveness, mercy, blessing, healing. You can reject it all. Just like you don't have to breathe oxygen, that's your choice. But remember, there's no existence fit for a human being away from God. To be without God eternally is to be without any light, joy, peace, true laughter, or freedom. So what's left? Well, it's a place of godlessness that's reserved for the devil and his demons. God's wrath is a father's wrath against an enemy, the devil, who plotted to steal your true identity, to steal your life. God so loves you, and He will never stop loving you, but your choice is still your choice. He will never force you to love Him. That's not the way love works. Love must be a choice. Is heaven exclusive? Yes, exclusively for you and for everyone who calls on Jesus, exclusively for God's children. Guess what? No demons, sickness, disease, or poverty are allowed in heaven. Oh, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, I have met no people who fully disbelieved in hell and also had a living and life-giving belief in heaven. Is that true? Do we abandon the hope of heaven because we're scared of a real hell? Heaven is unlimited in all goodness, time, and resource. Hell is just a black hole of insignificance, isolation, and only the memory of every rejection of Jesus' saving hand. It would almost be slightly amusing if it weren't so eternally tragic 
how some religious intellectuals judge God as being more loving and understanding if he were to provide 10, 20, maybe 30 different ways to heaven. You know, sort of a buffet of saviors to suit every taste and preference. Isn't that the epitome and the apex of arrogance? The condemned somehow telling God, you know what, I need options, God, and how that you should save me. I'd like my preferences catered to. I think it's kind of narrow-minded of you, God, to only have one way to heaven. Think about it. Just think about it for a second. You've never created one star, and yet you want to counsel God who's created at least 200 billion stars in this galaxy alone. 300 species of hummingbirds here on Earth. The massive blue whale that can, that can grow as long as three school buses and weigh up to 300,000 pounds. You want to instruct and lecture that creator, the full source of all intelligence in the entire known and unknown cosmos, how best he should save you from your sin and treason against him? Ah, the arrogance of our coexist folly that we should demand another savior other than Jesus. Only he can save us from our sins. There's only one savior that actually descended into hell for us. Jesus, the only begotten son of God. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, lived a perfect sinless life. Then in obedience to God, the father died and shed his blood on the cross for you and me. Guilty of no sin or crime, he died in our place for our sin and rebellion to redeem us from the curse. On the third day, God raised him up from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit to reign on high, seated at the right hand of God. One more scripture, Ephesians 4.10. He who descended is the very same as he who also ascended high above all the heavens, that he, his presence, might fill all things, the whole universe, from the lowest to the highest. Heaven is command central because that's where our commander Jesus reigns from. He alone is the king of all kings. So he reigns from the highest, most elevated place, heaven. Our hope is real. Yes, Heaven is real because Jesus, our Savior, is alive, victorious, and seated on the throne above every throne of authority. Oh, I know you want to pray right now. I'm sure you're itching to pray right now because you want to pray from a yes, heaven is real perspective. Let me lead you. Can I lead you? Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me for ignoring your work. You died on the cross for me. You rose up from the grave. You conquered death and hell. I accept you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Now, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, documented. I have official heavenly citizenship. I've got the real life passport. I'm a child of God. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, now that is some pretty strong medicine, my friend. You are already marked for eternal life in the blessed plan that God has for all of his children. You're a child of God. Yes, you are with your identity papers logged in the book of life. Isn't that exciting? Angels see you walking around and they know instantly, hey, that's a child of God with full benefits, authority and power. Let's listen to what he or she is, what their faith profession is, what they're praying. Now that's exciting. We've got help, instruction, podcasts of all kinds, prayers and tools to help your growth in faith so that you can put your heavenly citizenship to work here on earth. Just go to our website. It takes training, but you've already made the big step. Hit that Jesus button, you know, tell us your story and continue just to pursue all the tools that we have for you to live life strong.